um, we're looking at Isaiah and we're finishing up the book of Isaiah and we are um, focusing on the kingdom of God. Now, we've been in Isaiah for a number of weeks and we've learned quite a bit about Isaiah on this evening as we focus on our last lesson in Isaiah, we're going to focus on the kingdom of God. And like Jesus's parables of the kingdom of God, each view of the kingdom um, in Isaiah shows one facet of a great gem. It's really, this lesson is really going to introduce us to a few of those facets and really point out or point us to other facets that we can study on our own. So when we consider Isaiah chapters 40, Isaiah chapters 40, even to 66, which, you know, Isaiah has 66 chapters. Remember, some people call it like the little Bible, because just like the 66 books in the Bible, this uh, this uh, Isaiah has 66 chapters. As we study and continue, even after our gathering, to look at Isaiah, they're going to be um, this this evening. We're going to study passages about end times. Now, when we start focusing on end times, we really need to keep in mind of what Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. So this is another opportunity for us to link Old Testament scripture with New Testament scripture. So then when we think about what Jesus proclaimed, on the one hand, when talking about the kingdom of God, Jesus proclaimed that the kingdom of God had begun because the king himself, Jesus, had come. The end times, you know, began with Jesus's first coming. So that's one side to look at it. But on the other hand, he promised to bring the kingdom of God to its fulfillment um, when he came the second time. So there's a lot of confusion when it comes to this idea of kingdom of God. So I want to be sure that when we look at even Isaiah this evening, you know, for this reason of, you know, uh, one thing or another that we, uh, you know, for this reason that the prophecies in Isaiah about restoration, they sometimes refer to Jesus, um, to what Jesus began at his first coming and will finish at his return. But then at other times, it's a prophecy that refers only to what Jesus finished at his first coming or what he will begin at his second coming. So I know that's a lot to think about. I really want us to focus, though, on the fact that there are many scholars who have a lot to say, several viewpoints, you know, when it comes to interpreting these passages. But I really hope that on this evening, what we can do is have enough humility that we can be comfortable in not knowing, you know, and having all the answers. But then we can see what the Lord has to tell us enough to motivate our response in today's world. That's what I'm hoping will happen, that we will have enough humility, you know, because humility comes from knowing that we don't have all the answers, really. So we talk a lot about being a humble person. Well, sometimes that comes from not having all the answers. So we want to be motivated in our response today to what we read, even when we don't understand every detail of it. So what is the response? That's going to be our focus for this evening. What is the response? If there's not but one good application that you know we really intend to act upon, if it's not but one, that's a good thing. So then I want us this evening to start looking at, and we've looked at some of this before, okay? But I'm just going to review and I'm going to take us to the end of Isaiah. And if you would, please put your phone on mute. We can hear background noise. Thank you so much. You don't have to hang up. Just please put your phone on mute. So that, thank you. You're awesome. Okay. Thank you. And thank you all for coming in, you know, since we're having Facebook issues. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. So, Let's go, let's go, because this is our last study of Isaiah, okay? So turn your Bible, if you will, to Isaiah 40, and we're going to look at Isaiah uh, chapter 40 to about even 66, like I said, we're going to go to the end, okay? So we've read a lot in 40, 40 to 49, we've read a lot in 50 to 59, we really have, so some of this stuff you're going to be familiar with. And we'll get to the end. So when thinking about a highway, 
there was one of our Bible studies where we focused on God's sacred highway in chapters 35 and chapter 40, 42. And this highway has these various passages, not just in chapter 35 and 42, but there are other passages that speak to or it predicted what was going to happen at the end of the Babylonian exile. Remember that God's chosen people have been exiled. Okay, they've been exiled. They've been sent to Babylonia. So uh, the Lord led the Jews out of Babylon and back to Judah on a safe route. And this is called this sacred highway idea. Okay, sacred highway. Talking about restoration, really. A sacred highway. So when we read some of these passages, we must understand that God did not literally level mountains, you know, literally, but the Jews who returned to Judah, they were those who were prepared spiritually to take this risky journey out of this bondage into freedom back home or to the promised land. But understand that thousands of Jews, they remained in Babylon. Uh, they were content with their life and there, and they were maybe even fearful of change. Can you imagine a people who have been kept captive and then when they have the opportunity to be free, they don't take that opportunity because of being content with bondage? It may not make sense when we first hear it, but there are some situations like this one where people are in bondage and they become content. Well, my situation is what it is. You know, well, you know, I'm, I'm in bondage, you know, and... There may be an opportunity to go back to Judah, you know, to the promised land, but uh, I'm pretty comfortable where I am, you know, or uh, fearful of change. You know, there are people, these people could have been fearful to change. And even now we may feel that way, you know, so these people, thousands of Jews, they remained in Babylon. So let's look at this highway that Isaiah talks about. If we look at Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3, 4, and 5. Isaiah 40, 3, 4, and 5. It says that someone is like shouting, right? Clear a path in the desert and make a straight road um, for the Lord God and to uh, fill the valleys, uh, flatten every hill and mountain. You know, like I said, though, the Lord didn't actually uh, level, literally level mountains. But, but anyway, your, your slavery is past is what we see. Even in verse 2, their slavery is past, their punishment is over, the Lord made them pay double for their sins. And so now this is encouragement in chapter 40, at the beginning there. And someone is shouting, someone is shouting to clear the path, right? So when we look at verse 4 and 5, we see about flattening those mountains and then the glory of the Lord will appear for all people to see. Because the Lord has promised this. So a highway will be built is what we're seeing. A highway. And so remember, we're talking about the kingdom of God. We're talking about end times. A highway will be built in the desert for a procession, if you will, led by the Lord. The Lord who is Israel's king. And so someone is told to prepare a smooth path for the Lord's approach. Um, in even in other passages and God promises to build a highway for himself. So when we think about how this is fulfilled at Jesus's first coming, who comes to mind but uh, John the Baptist? Who comes to mind but John the Baptist preparing a way, right? We're familiar with John the Baptist, okay? Um, if we look at Luke chapter 3 verses 4 to 6, we know that God sent John the Baptist to tell the Jews to prepare for the coming Messiah, right? By repenting of their sins. And so this is where we have a connection of the Old and New Testament. That's where we have that connection. So we're seeing this, we're observing these passages or this, uh, you know, chapter 40 verses 3 to 5 and even reminiscing about Luke uh, 3, 4 to 6 as we think about, you know, how this was fulfilled at Jesus' coming. So I wanted to be sure that we saw that. I wanted to be sure. So then let's look at passages also um, that show what, uh, what they revealed about Jesus' second coming. 
So I want you to jot this down because I won't read every single thing, okay? Because this is Isaiah, I've walked us through it, but I've only walked us through it. <laughs> you know, some of Isaiah, you're going to want to sit at its feet. OK, so if you would. So I, I read uh, chapter 40, verses three to five, but I want you to jot down chapter 42, verses 14 to 17. If you would do that. 42 verses 14 to 17. OK. Because all this is talking about what's coming, what's coming. OK. Um, and then if you would jot down Isaiah 43, 16 to 21, 16 to 21, this is where the Lord prepares a way, just saying the same thing again. I'm going to be the one to cut a path through the mighty ocean, you see? And so that's talking about the highway again. So those are the other scriptures I wanted you to know about. So I read chapter 40, verses 3 to 5, and then I asked you to jot down 42. 14 to 17, and then 43, 16 to 21. Because these passages also reveal something about Jesus' second coming. God is going to overthrow or overcome all obstacles to Jesus' return. Jesus is going to safely and regally lead his people into his kingdom. So then that means that people need to spiritually prepare to join in that journey. And so I want to stop here to talk about spiritual preparation. Prepare spiritually to join Jesus is leading his people into the kingdom. So how do we prepare spiritually? When we think about preparation physically, I think that we can come up with some things. You know, when you prepare physically, what you do is you may go to the gym you know, we think about the Olympics now. There are going to be those who are going to participate in the Olympics. And so they're not waiting until the Olympics happens. They are already preparing themselves to be successful in whatever event they will participate in. So then what Isaiah is showing us when talking about God's sacred highway is that there are preparations being made. Even when we think about John 14, when Jesus is speaking this is was his parting words to his disciples jesus said i go to prepare a place for you you know and he says you know in my father's house are many mansions and he says if it were not so i would have told you so then he says i go to prepare a place for you so that and i will come again he said so that where i am you may be also so god is a preparing god and so the question is, how are we preparing ourselves spiritually so that we can join Jesus leading his people into the kingdom? So I want to talk about that, um, you know, thinking about uh, the physical with the gym or eating healthy or something like that. And we prepare ourselves for exams, right? Young people do that. And even us adults who are in school, we prepare our, our cars, you know, for journeys. Whenever we know we're going, it's almost the 4th of July. You may have plans to travel. And so you've already prepared or you're preparing your vehicle. You're preparing with uh, securing some place to lodge, right? So then spiritual preparation has to do with us thinking solely about God, like practicing, for example, consciously um, turning our thoughts to the, our destination. What do I mean? Well, if I know that this world is not my home, then maybe I should work on consciously, I should work on turning my thoughts to my final destination. It does not mean that the things here don't matter or that I should not prepare down here, but there is a eternal place that I need to prepare for. So maybe I need to start thinking about that place, you know, even more so than just thinking about this place. You know, we see uh, we see uh, hate in this world. We see uh, what uh, stealing and 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 double crossers, if you will. We see all of those things in this world. Well, at some point, it behooves us to sit down and say, "Okay, I see all of this." But what would it look like if I turn my thoughts to the kingdom of God? 
What would that look like? And so this is why I'm encouraging you that even after we finish Isaiah, that you read more on the kingdom of God. Okay, so if there ever was a homework assignment, it would be to read more about the kingdom of God so that you can keep your thoughts on your final destination. I don't know about you, but whenever I'm on an airplane, I am grateful, you know, that I, you know, um, live where I live. But when I'm going somewhere else and I'm in that airplane, I am waiting for my final destination, if you will. And I don't mean I don't mean that in the same way because heaven is our final destination. But I mean, I may have had connecting flights while flying. Right. And so while I'm in the airport or wherever and I'm just like, oh, my goodness, I want to get to, you know, my last stop. I'm thinking about that last stop. Now, I may be in the airport in Texas. I may be in the airport in uh, Atlanta. I may be in the airport in, uh, you know, North Carolina, something. But the point is, I'm trying to get somewhere and my mind is on that place. So what I'm saying is spiritual, spiritual uh, preparation looks like preparing ourselves spiritually to join the journey of Jesus is to prepare in that way, you know, is to prepare spiritually is to prepare for the kingdom and keeping your mind on that destination. Now, the second thing that we can do when thinking about the kingdom of God um, and thinking about the fact that we want to be spiritually prepared is to set aside time like you're doing now. You know, um, just let it look a little different. You know, set aside maybe 10 minutes a day for the next week, if you will, or perhaps even after that, um, to let the Holy Spirit prepare, you know, prepare a way. And that's when you sit with the Lord, you know, and just say, Lord, you know, I confess this, I, I repent this, I'm thankful for this, and let the Holy Spirit be your guide just in life overall. Not just when you're in trouble, not just when you need something, but 10 minutes to say, Holy Spirit, prepare me. You know, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, right? Pure and holy, tried and true. So we can't just sing the song and not give respectful time for the Lord to prepare me, us, to be a sanctuary. Okay? So I wanted to be sure that we that we focused on this idea that the Lord is preparing a way. This is revelation about Jesus' second coming, that Jesus will safely, regally lead his people into his kingdom. But are we ready? We are ready in the sense that we have given our hearts and our lives to Jesus. I'm just saying it's not just one time I say that and then I just leave all of this alone. No, I have to be in the habit of spiritual wellness. The habit of spiritual wellness. So then if you would turn to Isaiah 41, let's look at Isaiah 41, verses 17 to 20. Let's look at that. Verses 17 to 20. Okay. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, water in the desert. So again, these are prophecies. And if you were, uh, uh, if you were exiled in Babylon, you think of an immediate end time. <laughs> you know, whenever these people were hearing Isaiah's word, they were probably thinking about an immediate end time, an end to their trouble, to their captivity. You know, so it's all about who's reading and what their interpretation is. So that's why I was saying we're reading it enough to hopefully find one good application, you know, that we really intend to act upon. And I shared one application and that's the 10 minutes maybe, you know, and, and setting our minds on the final destination. So now let's just look at 41 verses 17 to 20. OK, if you look at that. Understand, let me set this up. So understand that the route from Babylon to Judah went through dry desert, really dry desert. And you can only imagine, well, some of you may have been to a desert, so you don't have to imagine. But this route from Babylon to Judah went through a dry desert, but God provided literal water for his people, for his children along the way and in the promised land. And so what we're going to see is water in the desert. And God also provided spiritual water, which we need to always remember. Um, if we think about the woman at the well, I think in the New Testament, so I'm trying to connect this. When we think about the woman at the well with the, in the New Testament, 
Jesus said, I will give you water, I will give you drink, and you will never thirst again. So what we're going to see in, in verse 41, 17 to 20 is that there's water in the desert. God provided literal water, but God also provided spiritual water, which is God's presence for these returnees. Spiritual water equals God's presence. So I hope I gave you time to turn to chapter 41, verses 17 to 20. And look at what it says there. It says that oh, the Lord is going to help the needy um, who are dying of thirst. And I'm, I'm always paraphrasing. So if you turn to 41, 17 to 20, you, you see what it is. I'm just paraphrasing, um, you know, what I read. But it, it does say that uh, what something like the Lord is going to take care of the needy, those who are dying of thirst and the ones who can't find water. Right. So those are his children. And the Lord is the God of Israel, and he's going to come and rescue them and not forget them. And the Lord is going to make rivers flow, even on mountain peaks. And God is going to send streams to fill valleys. Dry and barren land is going to flow with springs and become a lake. Isn't that awesome? That's amazing. That is amazing. And so the Lord is going to fill the desert, even with all kinds of trees. And I think we know that every tree cannot grow in the desert. But God is able to grow all of these trees in verse 19, even in the desert, because God shows us, hey, I am God. And everyone is going to see it and know that God is God, that God is God and God created it all. So what we're seeing is that the Lord provides water in the desert so that the needy may drink and the plants may flourish. Isn't that beautiful? So right when someone may think it is over or they're done, the Lord provides water and not just literal water, but spiritual water. So I want to stop here to help us think about that spiritual water. Okay. I want to I want to stop there just for a minute. So when you are outside now, it's really hot outside. Um, I think summer began on the 21st. So now we're in the summer season. And when you think about water in a hot place, wherever you are, the last time you were hot, you know, outdoors. And let's say you drink water. I want you to think of how quenching, how it quenched you, you know, how it quenched your thirst and how it was refreshing, you know, that water. Oh, my goodness. You know, my mom always says there's nothing that can take the place of water. You know, she says, you know, you can drink so many things, but there is nothing that can take the place of water, you know, especially when you're really hot. Right. OK, so if you're parched and your tongue is dry, you're sweating, you're in need of water, and then you get that water. How do you feel? Mm. How do you feel? Okay, I just want you to think about that. Mm. How do you feel? Okay, so all of us have had that feeling. So I want us to think about spiritual water as being God's presence. OK, how does that make you feel? How does spiritual water make you feel? Have you ever been so down that the only entity that could quench you was the Lord? Have you ever been, you know, concerned about a thing and the only peace that you could get your money could not buy? Have you ever had questions and you could not talk to anyone about it, but you knew that God's presence, well, you had access to God's presence. Mm. Spiritual water was given to you. Well, let's just remember to praise God for spiritual water because it is a blessing. It is indeed a blessing. Yes. Okay, so let's move on. I want us to now go, now we've read a lot of the 50, let's see, last, last week, we were in Isaiah um, 52, 53. So let's, let's go to Isaiah 66. I want to be sure because as we journey through Isaiah 52, 53, um, what we find is God's people, 
you know, suffered um, and we find that the Lord condemns them of idolatry. Yes, they did that again. Um, the Lord still helps those who are helpless and we see social injustices are condemned even in chapter 59. But when we get to chapter, let's see, as we get to chapter 65, I want us to look at, well, let's look at 60. Yes, 65. I want to focus here on new heavens, new earth. I want to focus on that because like I said, in this lesson, we are looking at um, these many facets of uh, the kingdom of God. Just like Jesus' parables talk a lot about the kingdom of God. So if you look at Isaiah 40 to 66, you can relate the way Isaiah is talking with the way Jesus talked in parables about the kingdom of God. And that's all we're doing now. I'm just pulling out some of those uh, facets. I'm not pulling out all of them because that's quite a bit. And I know you're going to study Isaiah, continue to study Isaiah on your own. I just want to make sure that we understand what we're studying or what's found in those particular chapters, okay? So if you look at Isaiah 40, starting at verse 1, all the way to Isaiah 66 and ending at that last verse 24, you will find much talk about the kingdom of God. But I'm just pulling out a few things. So new heavens, new earth. Look at 66, if you will. Let's see. I think I marked in my Bible. Let's see. Well, I marked 65, so let me go ahead and say something about that, too. Okay, so chapters 65 and 66, they speak of a new earth, a new earth. Now, some people believe that these things will happen for a thousand years after Christ returns. That's what they believe. These things will happen for a thousand years after Christ returns, and then afterward, God will remake the heavens and earth. That's one thought. God will remake the heavens and earth after these things happen for a thousand years. Other people believe, <laughs> other people believe that these passages describe literally or figuratively what life will be like in the new earth. Okay, so for right now, what we're going to do is just kind of jot down what we observe in these passages and what they say about the future and what we learn from these passages about the kingdom of God. That's what we're going to do. What do we learn about these from these passages about the kingdom of God? That's what we're going to do. We're not going to argue what scholars think and all those things. You can study those kind of things if you like, and that's great to do. Um, it's always good to see various perspectives. But what what the passages, what do they say about the kingdom of God? If you would, look at Isaiah 65, verses 20 to 25. Okay? Isaiah 65, verses 20 to 25. The Lord's... The, Uh-oh. Okay, something happened with someone's phone. Hello? Okay, yes, something happened. Someone was pressing buttons or something. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Okay, so yeah, yeah, what, that's good. Well, that gave us time to get to Isaiah 65, verses 20 to 25. Okay, so look at what the... Uh, what it says about the kingdom of God. Let's just see what we can learn. Um, it tells us that no child is going to die in infancy. Do you see that? And everyone's going to live to be a old, like to be older, like an old ripe age. Um, it says that anyone who is a uh, hundred years old is going to be considered young, and to die younger than that will be considered a curse. You know, these are just ideas from the last. I mean, from the kingdom of God. Um, God's people are going to live in houses that they build and they're going to enjoy grapes from their own vineyards and no one is going to take away their homes or their vineyards. Uh, God's church chosen people are going to live as old as trees and they will enjoy what they have earned. Their work is not going to be wasted and their children won't die of dreadful diseases. 
And God is going to bless their children and their grandchildren. And God is going to answer their prayers even before they finish praying. Ooh, <laughs> I thought that was powerful in verse 24. Mm. Even before they finish praying, God is going to answer their prayers. And wolves and lambs were grazed together. Do you all, well, we've read this before. Um, we read this before in a previous study. Wolves and lambs are going to graze together. Lions and oxen will feed on straw and snakes will... Uh, will eat only dirt and they're not going to bite or harm anyone on my holy mountain. I, the Lord, have spoken. So that's just the insight into the new heavens and new earth. I just want to make sure we see that as we're thinking about the kingdom of God. Okay. And then look at 66, if you will. Look at 66. Let's just look at verses 17 to 24. Okay. 17 to 24. What we find here is Isaiah is delivering both a threat and a promise. A threat and a promise. Okay? And what he tells them in verses 17 to 24 is that some of the people, um, they are they are contrary to who God wants them to be. Some of the people... They seem to know everything, you know, um, I know, you know, you think you know everything. See, they think they know everything in verse 18, but the time is coming where the Lord is going to bring together people of every language and nation to show these people God's glory by proving what God can do. And God is going to send survivors to all of these locations. And God is going to send them to announce God's wonderful glory to nations that have never heard about him. And they're going to really be, these people are going to see truly who God is. And God promises also that God is going to always, that they are going to always have descendants. And they will never be forgotten. So there's a threat and a promise at the same time. So God is a God who has many promises for us. Those of us who accept Jesus Christ as Lord of our life, we can stand on the promises in God's word. And when we do things and say things that are contrary to God's word, we have to be so careful. Because God is also one who sees all, knows all, and hears all. And the fact is, these persons who choose still to worship idols, these persons who choose still to go against what God says, God loves these persons. These are his chosen people. God loves them. And God also tells them, hey, 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 I'm going to show folks who think they know and think they know everything. I'm going to show them who I am. I am God and I still control all of this. I control all of this. And when we think about the kingdom of God, we mustn't ever stop seeking understanding about the kingdom of God. There is not enough time in one sitting to explore the kingdom of God. But what I wanted to do was to give you chapters 40 to 66 so that whenever you go into in-depth study or you're thinking about the kingdom of God, you can see what Isaiah's prophecies have to say about the kingdom of God. And I think we've done that, you know, quite a bit. Some of this was not new information because we've studied these, uh, these chapters. So my brothers and sisters, I encourage you to continue to study the kingdom of God. And I encourage you, although we've walked through the 66... <laughs> Chapters of Isaiah to never stop studying Isaiah's prophecy because he is a major prophet with major words for us. Okay, so let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, God, for giving us another opportunity to study together. God, I pray that you will continue to keep us, God, continue to have our minds on the destination. God, help us to set aside time so that the Holy Spirit can speak with us and guide us. God, thank you so much for giving us this time to consider your kingdom. And I ask God that you'll continue to teach us and continue to help us to prepare for your second coming. 
We love you and we praise you. Thank you, God, for every person listening even now. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you, Dr. McCoy. God bless you, too. And thank you for being here. We'll start Ezekiel on next week. Thank you, Dr. McCoy. You're welcome. Good night.